Welcome to the America's 360 podcast. Get the inside scoop and the outside perspective on the latest developments from Canada, Latin America, and everywhere in between. America's 360 is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Welcome back to another episode of America's 360. Hello, I'm John Molesky. This program is brought to you by the world's number one think tank for regional studies. And America's 360 is a collaboration among the Wilson Center's Argentina Project, Brazil Institute, Canada Institute, Latin American Program, and Mexico Institute. Last month, China's President Xi visited Moscow for a meeting with Vladimir Putin. At about the same time, President Biden was in Ottawa for a meeting with Prime Minister Trudeau. The Russia visit was just another indication of China's growing role as a global player, and Xi's focus is not limited to Moscow. In fact, the meeting between world leaders comes at a time when China's diplomatic relations with Latin American countries are developing at a rapid rate. How large a role can China play in the region? Will its diplomatic overtures to win over the Western Hemisphere's global south be successful? And what does it mean for North American influence and relationships in Latin America? Here to discuss These questions and more is our stellar team of analysts. Welcome back to the program, Wilson Center Distinguished Fellow, Cindy Arnson. Hi, John. Latin American Program Director, Benjamin Gadan. Greetings, John. Canada Institute Director, Christopher Sands. Hello, bonjour, John. Brazil Institute Director, Bruno Santos. Hello, John. And Mexico Institute Deputy Director, Leela Ahmed. Happy to be here. Great to have all of you back with us. Uh, Let's begin looking at the, the big picture of China's growing influence. Just looking at some numbers from the Foreign Affairs Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, while the U.S. is still Latin America's largest trading partner, when you divide Latin America, where you reduce Latin America to just South America, China is the number one trading partner. And here's a stunning figure that uh, since 2000 to 2020, a 20-year period, uh, China and Latin America, their uh, trade has grown 26-fold from 12 billion to 315 billion and that's expected to double by 2035. So in the opening script I talked about uh, you know is China will they win over the, the global south? It sounds as if they're well on their way to doing so. Maybe if we go in the order of introduction and just get some quick thoughts from each of you on the rise of China in the western hemisphere and and you know how you see the big picture developing. Cindy, could we begin with you please? Sure, John. China is a source of um, enormous development financing and infrastructure financing in Latin America. At its height, it was about $34.5 billion um, in one year alone in 2010. And that figure for many years was more than the combined total of the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Latin American Development Bank known as CAF combined. Um, so it it has uh, enormous um, capital to invest in in Latin America. And as the figures you um, indicated, I mean, the trade has just exploded with China's dy- dynamic growth going, I, I, my figures, I think, are a little bit different than, than those of the House Committee, going from about 10 billion in the year 2000 to the record of 450 billion in 2021. And it's important to emphasize that the trade is in a handful, predominantly in a handful of primary commodities, things like iron ore and copper um, from Chile and Peru and soy from Brazil and Argentina um, and um, oil as well from Ecuador and and, uh, um, from Venezuela. But it is an enormous economic presence. Um, and its economic weight is, I think, simply unmatched in the Western Hemisphere. Benjamin Gaudet. All that is true, but actually a lot of that is changing. I mean, so China faces economic headwinds um, and its slowest growth in, in recent memory. That will diminish its demand for lots of the commodities exported by South America. And it also has diminished its appetite to invest in giant infrastructure projects that have given China a lot of leverage in, in developing 
countries in Africa and also in Latin America. So I think we're actually at an interesting moment where the trajectory of China is really changing in places like Latin America. Now, that doesn't mean that its market won't be very attractive, particularly, again, to countries like Brazil and Argentina and Chile that export commodities. Um, And it doesn't mean that it won't continue as it is in Peru right now, buying up critical infrastructure, including energy production and, and transmission. But it does mean that the pace and scale of Chinese engagement is changing, and that has some real geopolitical consequences. Thanks. Chris Sands. Canada was a beneficiary as much as Latin America was selling commodities in China. And there was a period of time where China was the largest U.S. trading partner, outpacing both Canada and Mexico. And we gradually saw that shift back to where things were before. The U.S. as Canada, as the United States' largest trading partner, Mexico in second place, and China in third. And I think that very much reflects what what Benjamin uh, was talking about, where commodity-driven cycles um, really saw China China's position both rise and fall. China was Canada's second largest trading partner for quite a while, but because of the disagreements between China over and Canada over Meng Wanzhou, the CFO of Huawei, who had been arrested on a U.S. warrant by the Canadians, and the two Michaels, uh, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, who um, who were taken hostage by the Chinese in retaliation, there was a seri- there were a series of Chinese trade actions. Uh, banning Canadian canola, banning Canadian wheat, and even Canadian softwood lumber that really reduced Canada's reliance on China as an export market, not voluntarily, but just just because. And now that the Michaels are home and Meng Wanzhou has been returned to China, there's still so much ill will that I think Canadians are looking as much as possible to decouple from China and uh, to use that almost as a badge of honor to re-engage with the United States. Hmm. Bruna, Bruna Santos. Well, clearly Beijing is pushing for geopolitical ties as well through infrastructure and ports and energy in Brazil. It's it's clear. But even though both countries are member of the BRICS and the G20, Brazil is still the only Latin American country in that group that is still has still not joined the China's Belt and Road Initiative. But Lula's um, foreign ministries has made uh, it very clear that um, they there's no reason for Brazil not to participate in those in that group. And as you know, the U.S. is Brazil's lar- biggest investor, but China is its biggest uh, trading partner. And uh, of course, both are, are equally important for Brazil's technological development. And um, but Brazil can also can have also uh, an important role for Chinese investments. And that's what we've been seeing uh, along uh, across the past uh, years. And since 2017, it has increased like more than 200 percent the amount of like uh, the, of Chinese companies investing in the in the country, especially in the in the in the electricity sector. But also, it's also increasing in the technological sector. So just like if you look at, for example, China 3 or its presence in the country, it accounts for uh, a big part, a big portion of the whole investment being made in solar panels in, in the country. Great. Thanks, Bruna. Leela, Leela Abed. Yeah, so I, I think ever since Washington and Beijing were kind of locked in a fierce trade war and with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the opportunities really that nearshoring has presented, we know that companies around the world have moved their production centers closer to where their consumers are and 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 you know, and this and to avoid really shipping issues and geopolitical strains. And this scenario in many ways has benefited Mexico given its geographical sort of proximity to one of the world's largest consumer markets, which is the United States. And therefore, in the last several years, many major Chinese companies have heavily invested in Mexico to tap into what is known as the North American trading block and really exploit its benefits. So with the new USMCA in place, Chinese firms are establishing factories that allow them now to labor their goods as made in Mexico, which were previously labeled as made in China, but are now able to ship them from Mexico and ship finished products into the United States almost duty free. So to give you some data from Mexico's government, between January and September of 2022, China was the country with the highest investment in company relocation projects in Mexico, representing 40%. And a study from the Bank of Mexico found that two of the main reasons why companies reallocate to Mexico are trade tensions between the United States and China, 
as well as compliance with the rules of origin under the USMCA. So nearshoring most definitely has played a key role in kind of the growing presence of China in Mexico, but it's not really the only reason why China has invested in Mexico. It also has financed key infrastructure projects of the AMLO administration in 2020. The Chinese Development Bank announced it would invest $600 million for the construction of the Dos Bocas oil refinery, which is in the, in the home state of the Mexican president, um, Tabasco. And in 2020, the same uh, year, uh, a Mexican consortium announced that in partnership with the China Communications Construction Company, uh, they would build AMLO's infamous Mayan train, um, which is a staple, right, of, of his fourth transformation government. And also in the, telecommun- the telecommunications sector, China's Huawei, which landed a contract in 2017 to provide sort of equipment for Mexico's communication network, has raised real concerns of what this means to have uh, Chinese telecommunications equipment very close to the border um, and has ri- has raised sort of security, national security and cybersecurity issues uh, in the United States. And so despite the, you know, the efforts by past Mexican administrations to sort of strengthen economic ties with China, the U.S. still remains Mexico's top trading partner and foreign investor. Um, but I, I do see that Chinese companies will continue to invest in strategic sectors, including energy and tele- telecommunications, like has been mentioned here by my colleagues. Um, and it's definitely something that, you know, could kind of shift uh, the relationship between the United States and Mexico economically, which is so important. And with Canada uh, sort of as, as a, a key partner of the USMCA. And um, I, I think in economic terms, this this can signify something really important for the future of China's presence in Mexico. And um, hopefully uh, I'll have the opportunity to talk about uh, sort of the rise of fentanyl and the precursors coming from China into Mexico, because that's sort of the security component to China's presence in Mexico and what that means for the United States. OK, great. Thanks, Leela. Chris. Well, I was just going to jump in on uh, on Leela's comment, because I think one of the interesting things we're starting to see is Canada and Mexico um, in some competition to show that they are closer to the U.S. and farther from China. And Canada has been taking a series of steps, disallowing Chinese investment in lithium mining companies, moving uh, away from certain Chinese investments and trying to use their national security rules to block them, while at the same time embracing U.S. policy on a range of issues, um, including uh, their Indo-Pacific strategy with a more forward military presence in the Indo-Pacific organized around Japan and uh, and South Korea. And all of this, what they're trying to say is we've, we, we don't see a future as China's ally. We're going to be more the American ally than ever. And I think in that, they're hoping that they get a better return from investors in the United States who feel at least Canada's on side and will be safe. But it will be a competition with Mexico and uh, the Canadians are bringing it. You know, about this uh, cooperation versus competition question, in the United States, the the debate around China has been largely negative in recent years, and uh, even the term new Cold War has been employed. Uh, I'm wondering what you could tell us about how countries of Latin America feel about uh, and we know China has, or Canada has had its conflicts or its its tensions as well. But I wonder, can we make any comments across the region, maybe specific countries that uh, have any reticence about dealing with China, or is it the opposite? Are they ready to fully embrace China and welcome all of its investment? And assum- assuming that what comes with that is growing influence, there's absolutely no appetite, almost anywhere in Latin America for turning down Chinese investment and trade. Mm -hmm. It's a non-starter in almost every capital in the region. And and frankly, it makes the United States sound silly to even raise the possibility. The kind of posture you just heard described by Chris um, in Canada is simply not something you'll hear in Latin America. Bruna could talk about the view from Brasilia. um, But the Latin Americans, I think, are, are firmly in the camp of gaining whatever benefits they can from anyone who wants to invest and trade throughout the Americas. The economies in the region haven't grown in a decade, and the infrastructure is very poor. And I think even though it is true that there's a real values mismatch between authoritarian China and democratic countries in the Americas, there's just an unwillingness and maybe an inability, given fragile economic conditions, to turn down opportunities to trade with China and to accept Chinese investment in infrastructure. Cindy Arnson. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think no Latin American country wants to be forced to take sides in this um, growing tension between the United States and, and China. And what's interesting is that the um, the countries that have these close ties with with China are by no means all countries of the left. Um, there are two center right uh, centrist countries right now in Ecuador and Uruguay. Um, one who has signed a, a free trade agreement with China, one who is seeking it, and both of those countries actually have been turned down by the United States in their efforts to negotiate a, a free or to even. Um, discuss a free trade agreement um, um, because they're left out of of this uh, um, of this multiplicity of free trade agreements that the that the United States has in the region. Um, so I think it goes across the ideological spectrum that people see benefit to their own economies at a time of um, very difficult um, economic straits, um, yeah. as we've discussed in previous episodes. You know, money talks, right? Leela, let's go to you. And then Bruna, I know you want to say something, but I have a question for you as well. But Leela, you go ahead now, please. And I couldn't agree more with what Benjamin and Cindy have said about Latin American countries, but I think Mexico has to be very careful, right? Because of its close relationship to the United States and Canada and the USMCA. And there's a key contribution of the USMCA, which is Article 32.1 which basically discourages any party from signing false free trade agreements with countries that do not allow open competition or fully or, or full property rights and therefore cannot trade freely. I mean, this is obviously inserted into the USMCA tax um, and it's aimed at China, right? Aimed at discouraging trade with China, especially Mexico and, and, and the key parties of the USMCA. And so I think that even though we see a lot of Chinese investment in Mexico in key areas, I think it's going to have to be uh, way more careful than its Latin American counterparts and on its approach on China and how it allows Chinese investment to flow into its country. Bruna, I, I, we had some breaking news as we prepared for this recording and that President Lula, because of a case of pneumonia, has to postpone his trip to yes. China. Uh, but, I, you know, we know that it will be rescheduled eventually. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what expectations are for that trip. Yeah, the trip uh, that was just ca recently canceled was going to be a big trip. I mean, he was traveling with a delegation of 240 people among ministers, cabinet members, business owners. And by the way, Lila, visit to Huawei was expected, was set. And I think that uh, this trip happening after uh, Lula's visit to the U.S., I think, is a sign of Brazil's willingness to assert its independence. It's like Lula going back to Brazil's uh, foreign policy tradition of non-alignment, no, no automatic alliances with the West or, or China. And um, of course, there, there were like ideas of discussions around trade, around uh, the, the possibility or not for Brazil to join the Belt and Road Initiative, but also expectations about whether or not Lula would bring up the possibility of like playing a role or demonstrating um, some power to mediate a conflict in Ukraine and the role of China and all that, which is also kind, sounds kind of naive coming from Brazil, which is a country that has no like has, is not be, is not seen or perceived as an impartial mediator in this because it's part of the BRICS. But just uh, I, I think that uh, in, in that perspective and the, with the message that Lula sent and exactly like I agree 100 percent with with Benjamin on that, like we can't we can't afford to take sides on this. So I think Brazil seems to prioritize like more flexible partnerships now rather than rigid alliances in order to adapt to this uh, world that is totally different than the first and second terms of Lula. And this may involve actually collaborating also with countries in uh, in the global north. So the, I, I'm confident that Brazil might prioritize the finalizing the free trade agreement with the European Union, for example, and or to join the the OECD, and but also keeping um, partnerships with the global south, ex exploring the possibility of a free, free trade agreement between Mercosur and China. So I think that's that more flexible approach to those alliances is, is what I foresee for Brazil's foreign policy in the coming years. Thanks. You know, it, it's it's always difficult when I, and, and from the host chair to look at the clock part of my job. And we are just about out of time. And we've 
only begun to scratch the surface. I, I think we could all probably agree that we're going to revisit this topic sooner rather than later and, and dive a little deeper into some of these specifics. But before we close today, I want to ask for a final thought from each of you. You know, as you look ahead in this question of China's growing influence in the hemisphere, uh, is there a particular uh, circumstance or dash or project or something that you'll be looking at that could be telling about how these trend lines will continue? Because, you know, one of the underlying, uh, the white noise underneath this discussion is, does this change U.S. strategy, Canadian strategy, Mexican strategy, North American strategy as they look South uh, because of China's rapid growth. And so if you could each take maybe about 10 seconds for a quick thoughts, I hate to do that to you. And let's uh, just to mix things up, we'll do it in reverse order of introduction, which puts you in the, the leadoff position, Leela. Yeah, thank you, John. I think something that, you know, Mexico is going to be looking at very closely, something that I mentioned at the beginning, and that is fentanyl and the precursors coming in from China. Uh, you know, the seizures that CBP has registered um, over the last two years have you know, completely uh, increase. It is something that is costing American lives. And it's it's definitely a priority for the White House. It's a priority for Mexico. And it's 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 a huge aspect of the security cooperation agenda between the two countries. Great. Thank you. Bruna. One topic of concern, I think, is energy and, of course, the investments that China has been uh, like doing in Brazil for in technology and sectors that are important for technological progress, such as critical minerals and uh, the whole uh, industry of semiconductors. So that's one of the things that I would follow up closely um, as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Christopher? Well, I think it's going to be interesting for Canada. Um, We just saw uh, in the lead up to President Biden's visit to Ottawa, uh, charges that a member of parliament had actually discouraged the release of the two Michaels uh, to the Consul General of China in Toronto. Um, Something that shocked everyone, forced this member of parliament who is ethnically Chinese to step back from his seat and sit as an independent and try to clear his name. It it has been a shock to Canada just how much China has infiltrated Canadian politics and tried to interfere with their democracy. So if anything, I see the Canadians becoming much more hardline. Remember that 5% of Canada's population, which is just about 40 million now, is uh, is of Chinese ethnic origin. So this is so mm. Canada will not ignore China, but they seem to be moving much more closely into alignment with the U.S. Yeah, Benjamin. One thing that I'll be watching is whether we can identify the right metrics for measuring this competition in the Western Hemisphere. I think often we just use the wrong measurements of of how we're competing with China. You know, whether countries recognize Taiwan, whether they're members of China's Belt and Road Initiative, whether they they buy infrastructure from Huawei for telecommunications and not recognizing that this is a long struggle. And that what really matters is, is the United States presence in investing in infrastructure, in investing in diplomatic relationships, in trading with the countries in this region. And, you know, that's what I'll be keeping an eye on. Thanks, Benjamin. Cindy, you get the final word. Sure. I'll be watching, um, as Benjamin was hinting, um, the the battle really between the United States and China over 5G infrastructure, um, That and, and especially looking to see what U.S. companies are able to offer Latin American countries that are interested in 5G um, to compete with Huawei. Um, I'll also be looking to see whether the growing momentum in South America and Central America towards creating uh, marine protected areas um, will bump up against the Chinese illegal fishing and the parking of these fishing huge fishing fleets just outside the protected areas and the territorial waters of numerous Latin American countries and how that issue plays out um, and whether countries in creating these marine protected areas can actually um, enforce um, in- enforce those territorial waters. Great. Th- thanks, Cindy. Thanks to all of you. As, as always, we learn a lot from you and really appreciate it. You know, this is the part of the program where I read this paragraph that says, this episode of America's 360 was produced by Oscar Cruz, Zoe Reed, with the assistance of Aldrin Ballesteros, Emma Brown, Sarah Doshi, and Patrizia Tracoli. Uh, but I want to uh, go off the script here, pull back the curtain, and Zoe, turn on your microphone. Zoe, read one of those people I thanked. This is her final episode of America's 360, and she has been one of the, the stalwarts behind this program. Zoe, are you there? You know, I was going to read this very sentimental paragraph that I wrote about you and tell you how much we appreciate you and and how we'll miss you. But, you know, I thought, what the hell, let's uh, just... 
turn on the microphone. You know, you're always behind the scenes, making us look good, certainly making me look way smarter than I am. Um, so uh, your thoughts, we hate to see you go, but I know you're moving on to a terrific opportunity. Thank you very much, John. And I've loved working on America's 360. I just like to thank all of you. I think in every topic that we choose, I learn why the podcast is called what it is. Everything impacts every country of the Americas, whether it comes to mind geographically or not. And I think you will prove that again in this episode. So I'd like to thank you all for letting me work on this project. Thank you. Sincerely, I know I speak for all of us when I say that. And congratulations. And we'll be watching. We know they're a great success in your future. But as we say in the business, the show will go on. And we'll be back in a couple weeks, minus Zoe, and while we're still missing Zoe, uh, with another episode of America's 360. So until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thank you for joining us. You have been listening to America's 360, a podcast about the innumerable ties among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. You can subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To learn more about our programs, please visit wilsoncenter.org. And please join us again next time for another episode of America's 360.